Today is Tuesday, September 18th, 2018, and my name is Scott Henshaw. I am in the Alumni House with David Gwynn to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to start the interview by asking you about your background. Can you tell me when and where you were born? Uh, I was born August 10th, 1964, right here in Greensboro, specifically at Cone Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, there's, <laughs> there's photographic evidence of that. So. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> And can you t tell me about your family and your home life? What did your parents do? Okay, um, well, uh, I, I did grow up in Greensboro, in southwest Greensboro. Um, my mom worked, uh, was a career employee of the Internal Revenue Service. She worked for 30 years there. At the end of her time, she was actually working in computer and facilities security for IRS when she retired in 1985. My dad, um, did a lot of things early on. He was a Greensboro firefighter for a little while, but ultimately he settled into the furniture finish industry. He worked for DuPont for about 20 years when they had a plant here in Greensboro. And after that, he worked for a couple of different uh, companies. Uh, his last job working with furniture finishes, I think he was working for PPG in okay. the early 80s. Cool. And what schools did you attend? Uh, I went to Alderman Elementary School for one year, uh, then went to Vandalia Christian School for six very interesting years, um, Allen Junior High and mm -hmm. Smith High School. Okay. And did you have any favorite subjects while you were in high school? I was, I was a geography history person, okay. um, which kind of continued through yeah. the rest of my life as well. You had some good teachers, is that what? Oh, yeah, definitely, and I, you know, it, was, it was a thing I was always interested in. Um, and also, when I was in high school, I also took a uh, video production class. Oh, I really okay. enjoyed that a lot, too. Mm -hmm. um, I, at some point, thought I was going to go into broadcasting as a career, and right. I'm kind of glad that didn't happen. But. <laughs> okay. Uh, so when did you attend UNCG as an undergraduate? Uh, I was here twice as an undergraduate. I did the, uh, the shifts, or the... Uh, the uh, segmented system. I was okay. here from 1980, fall 1982 to fall 1984 the first time, um, at which point I left for a while, uh, worked for about four, four and a half years, and then came back in the fall of uh, 1989, graduated in fall of 1991. Okay. Um, and then left again for a few years and came back and got my master's here in 2000. Seven to two thousand nine. Okay. Uh, so we're, first, we're going to focus on your undergraduate career. Can you tell me why you chose UNCG? Uh, I chose UNCG for the same reason a lot of people in the Triad area choose UNCG. It was close, right? And I could actually live at home while I was going to school, which I did. I I did not live on campus here. I actually commuted, uh, lived lived in my parents' house while I was going to school here. Um, both times, actually, as an undergrad, because when I moved back, uh, the idea was that I would find a place, but I ended up just staying in their house for. It's a lot more economical that way. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, UNCG, I think, at that time was a lot more of a. It had a lot more of a local focus. It didn't have quite as broad a statewide and nationwide enrollment that had some. But, you know, and. Originally, I was planning to do uh, broadcasting as a major, and there was a reasonably good broadcast cinema program here at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, right. So it seemed like a good, good, good call at the time. Okay. And what did you end up with it as, a, as your major? Uh, I double majored uh, in geography and sociology. Um, in both disciplines, I concentrated in urban planning, urban studies. And I also ended up with a psychology minor, but that was basically just because I was a psychology major at one point early year, and I only needed to take one more course to get the minor, so I right. figured I might so as well. So why not? Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about UNCG in the 1980s and early 90s. What do you remember about it? Just the layout and what it was like? It was a lot different. Uh, I mean, physically, obviously, it was a lot different. It was a much more compact campus. You know, a lot of places where there are campus buildings now, there were houses then. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those houses were serving as campus buildings and campus offices at the time, but um, but they were still houses. Right. Um, Elliott Center, for example, was a lot smaller at that point. It was before it got gutted, I think, in the early 2000s mm -hmm. and extended. Um, and I spent a lot of my undergraduate time in Elliott Center. Uh, as we'll get into later, mm -hmm. um, there was no connector between Elliott Center and the library at that right. point. Well, when I came back to Greensboro the first time after they built that, I thought, 
wow, what a stroke of genius. Why didn't somebody think of that a ton earlier? Because, you know, it was yeah. always back and forth. Why not make it easy to get back and forth? Uh, it was a much smaller school. And when I first got here, it was we were still less than 20 years after uh, UNCG went co-ed at that point, mm. which seemed like a long time to me at the time because, you know, it happened before I was born, but that seems like no time at all now. Right. But it was a lot more woman-centric at UNCG at the time. Um, the way I've said this a lot in the last couple of years, and I hope this doesn't sound offensive anyway, is there was not so much of a testosterone influence here at that point. Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, there was, there was still majority, majority women students here. Right. Um, sports was not a thing that anybody really, I mean, we had teams, but nobody cared. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a big thing. When I got here, they had just introduced the Greek system at UNCG, uh, which mm -hmm. was controversial right. in some ways at the time. And um, yeah, that led to kind of one of the first controversies when I was here, too, was the first homecoming queen being elected at UNCG, which was controversial in its own way. So it was a time of change for UNCG specifically. You know, it was becoming a broader population base and, and more, more male-focused. Mm -hmm. At the time, um, it was yeah, UNCG had the reputation when I came in, and it still does uh, that the G you know, stood for gay, so it was UNC gay because a lot of the men were here, um, whether through perception because it was primarily a women's school or because of program. A lot of the programs up uh, there were a lot of gay men here, or a lot of people that were perceived as gay men, whether they were or not. So mm -hmm. it was it was definitely a different environment. Mm -hmm. And it was a smaller environment, I think, you know, more right. people knew each other right. than... Yeah. More compact, less people as well. So you spent a lot of time in the Elliott Center. You do, can you tell me a little more about that and what you did there and what kind of activities? Oh, yeah. I was, uh, or I was, I was involved in a lot of uh, student activities, actually, even before I was a student here. Okay. Um, I was involved in the radio station, WUAG. That was my primary area and was also pretty heavily involved in the Student Government Association here as well. Mm -hmm. um, with UAG, and I don't know if we want to do that now or if we come back to it later. Uh, we can talk about it now. I was asking about EUC just because you had said you were yeah. in there. Now the radio well, at station that, was at that time. The radio station actually was in Elliott oh, was Center. It? Okay, I didn't yeah. know that. Okay, um, it had been in Elliott Center since it was established as WEHL back in the '60s. It was on the third floor, and the offices were right down the hall from okay. student government. So I spent much of my life in that hallway, which I don't think exists in Elliott Center anymore. Right. You know, we had our own little suite with the radio station, student government, and our own bathroom. So it was... Well, that's everything you need. It was, it, was, it, was, it was very comfortable. I slept many nights on my couch in that, in that area. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and start talking about music and the music scene here at UNCG okay. and Tate Street. Um, can you talk about maybe important places for music around UNCG? Or? Yeah, you have to understand at that point um, in North Carolina, um, you could drink at age 18. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was uh, 18 for beer and wine and 21 for liquor, which never made any sense to me whatsoever, but okay. Um, it was before the national 21 drinking age came in, which I think was around 85 or 86. I was actually one of the last generations that could successfully drink all the way through that period, and I did. <laughs> um, but it was a lot different in those days. I think in a lot of college towns, there was a lot more of a scene around colleges because younger people could actually go to bars and could, you know, go to bars and see bands and bars could afford to do that because the younger people could drink as well. Right. And being college students, they did. Right. Usually to excess. But um, there was there was a lot more music nearby right around UNCG in those days. Uh, the biggest club, obviously, and the most famous one in those days was Friday's on Tate Street, which mm -hmm. is where um, recently where the Subway and Leon's were. Um, I think they're, the Subway moved out, and there's something else in there now, and I forget mm -hmm. what it is. It changes often. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Subway was there for like 30 years yeah. almost. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it did well. But once uh, once it was gone, yeah, th that little area changes a lot. Uh, Friday's was an amazing place. You know, it was this little pizza deli place by day. And they actually had a really good roast beef sandwich if you ever went in there at lunch. 
But it was kind of dark and grungy. It had originally, I think in the 70s, it had been a place called Pizzaville, uh-huh. uh, which actually was related to and started by the founders of Biscuitville. Oh, okay. Um, Great. Which they, is a Greensboro and, company yeah. found in Greensboro. And they branched out into pizza in a different way later on. But, um, and, uh, but by night, they had bands in there. I think starting probably in the early 80s, it was, I remember knowing about the place when I was in high school. Of course, I couldn't go because I wasn't 18. Right. But, um, the, I mean, REM played there, eighty one ish. I know there's actually a lot of there's a couple of really good bootlegs of REM shows oh, yeah. from nineteen eighty one that you can find online uh, when they're playing at Fridays. It was kind of one of their haunts. They played there a lot. Okay. Uh, and in fact, they were pretty big by nineteen eighty four when Fridays closed, and they actually made a trip up here and played closing night at Fridays. Oh, awesome which I didn't get to see, and I'm really mad because I had agreed to work security at a Genesis concert at the Coliseum that night. I missed the final performance of R.E.M. at Friday's seeing Genesis. <laughs> now, I, not that I'm still bitter about no, that or anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, Friday's was great. I mean, everybody played Friday's. I, mean, I saw the Violent Femmes there. Um, I saw I, just tons and tons of bands, you know, yeah. from local bands like Treva Spontane and The Graphics, aka The Graphic. Um, why am I drawing a blank on lots of band names now? This That's is okay. sort of what I used to do. <laughs> um, there, were, and there, you know, there were just tons of local bands. I work at the radio station, too. In a lot of cases, I always had uh, comp tickets. I was always guest listed for a lot of this stuff, too. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, when I saw the Violet Femmes, um, I'd actually just interviewed them at the radio station cool. earlier that day. And when I came to the front door, actually, I can't remember if it was Gordon Gano or Brian Ritchie, actually saw me at the door and came to the door and told the door guy to let me in, <laughs> which was kind of cool. Yes, yeah, so um, yes. Yeah. They, they weren't as big then as they are now. But, yeah. um, but um, everybody, everybody played at Friday's. Yeah, and it was a tiny little hole in the wall kind of club. It was much smaller than like the Blind Tiger or anything mm-hmm. like that. Now, um, there were other clubs on Tate Street too. The other big one during that time was the uh, Nightshade Cafe, which was in the basement of a restaurant called Hong Kong House, which is now mm-hmm. called Boba House. Right. Um, because I'm all into history of buildings, I will tell you that had originally been an Apple House Diner, which was a which was a local chain of diners here in Greensboro mm-hmm. that actually f- featured prominently in Tate Street segregation in the early '60s. But that's a whole different story. Right. But uh, and the basement had, I think, in the late '60s, been something called the Apple Cellar, okay. uh, which was kind of a club venue, you know, like a, a music venue. Uh, which I imagine all kinds of hippies doing weird things with lights mm-hmm. in the 60s and 70s. Right. But by the 80s, it was kind of a dumpy little little club in the basement called the Nightshade Cafe. And that was where you would have maybe small or local acts. Eugene Chadbourne, I know, used to play there a lot. Who you may or may not have, people may or may not know. He was kind of very famous in <laughs> people that are really into obscure music from the early 80s. He did things like play electric rakes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Um, and he was affiliated with a band called Shockabilly. I think, yeah. So there was a lot of cool, interesting, different music there as well, wasn't it? Even- yeah, and there were other there were other venues around it too that weren't so much band centric, like New York Pizza, which I think now has bands once in a while. They didn't have bands in those days. They did have really cheap beer on Tuesday and Thursday nights. So mm-hmm. I mean, quarter draft and two dollar pitchers. You can imagine the high quality of the beer they yeah. were serving at that price. But college students. So. Yeah, and yeah, uh, and the fact that they were serving cheap beer actually made the pizza taste good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Right. Um, there were, and there were, you know, in the uh, was, as we moved into the uh, the late eighties, I wasn't living here, so I don't know so much about what the scene right. was at that point. But when I moved back, uh, there weren't, you know drinking age was up to 21 and most of the musical venues in Greensboro were not specifically right around Tate Street at that point. There was a little club called The Edge, I think, which was in an old house, which is right about where the FedEx office is on mm-hmm. Tate Street right now. Um, it had, when I was early, here earlier, it was a restaurant called Mr. Rosewater's, <laughs> but now it was a, yeah, they ripped out all the walls and made it into a club and it was sort of this 
alternative, ravey kind of scene, but in a little house mm-hmm. in the late 80s, early 90s. But most of the uh, facilities for music had moved downtown. There was places like the Miracle House of Rock and Roll, um, the original Somewhere Else Tavern, which I think was on Freeman Mill Road, hmm. um, other places like that. Another big venue when I was here as an undergrad that I really liked uh, and had a lot of interesting memories of was Secret Garden. Mm-hmm. It was downtown. Uh, the building's still there. It was this weird little place. It was a Chinese restaurant by day, uh-huh. and the owner decided he was going to actually make more money with the place by night. Uh, he would have alternative music dance nights, and that was actually the first place I did club DJ gigs at, um, because he had sort of a deal with the radio station. We'd send somebody over there, and I did that several times. But he'd also have bands in there. That was the first place the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers played in Greensboro. Um, I got to be around for the interview with them at the radio station the day before, too, and this was, I think, 1984. Uh Do you still have your interviews recorded or transcribed? I got a couple. I've got... um, I've got one that I did with the Flesh Tones, but that was in Charlotte, Mm -hmm. Um, and one with a band called Male Model that just wandered uh, them, and the Skunks, which was kind of a well-known band from Austin, apparently. They both just sort of wandered in the radio station one night when I was on the air, and I said, sure, I'll interview you. Because I did the Saturday night show. Yeah, they were usually playing on Saturday night, so they'd just sort of pop in beforehand. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we're already knee deep in your radio stuff. So, can you tell me back up just a little bit and tell me how you got involved with the radio station, the campus radio station? I'm not going to say knee deep in the hoopla. <laughs> I'm just not. Um, I got involved with the radio station actually the summer before I started at UNCG. Uh, I'd been in, I'd been doing broadcasting related stuff when I was in high school and right. thought, and was planning to go to UNCG as a broadcast cinema major. I had a friend from high school, uh, and she had actually just found out that uh, WAG actually at that point they actually let non-students work at the radio station in the summer and she was doing a a jazz show there uh, which was an odd thing for her Um, (laughs) but um, she suggested maybe I should come by and talk to them and I came by one day and they said okay you want to start Saturday night I'm like (laughs) wow okay well is somebody going to show me how to do this stuff Um, so I had a training session with a I was trained by like this 15 year old kid who was working there <laughs> which was sort of odd too I mean obviously he wasn't a student either right, yeah. uh, so he trained me on the morning and basically they just left me alone to work my first night Wow! Um, and I was really mad because at that point WAG was also running Greensboro Hornets baseball games right. and there was one that night and there was a rain delay uh-huh. so yeah my first night on the air I was scheduled to be on from 10 to 1 and I didn't get on the air till like 12.15 I only had 45 <laughs> minutes and I was like Yes. <laughs> so, so tell me about what what your job there was like and what were the responsibilities and. Oh, my first year, uh, I was just I was just a DJ, and there was a lot of turmoil going on at the radio station at that point. Anyway, there was um, a little background. A year before, this was back when I was still in high school, but I sort of was following it, and knew what was going on, and heard a lot more about it later. Um, WUAG. There was uh, had been broadcasting for years and years in the educational band, which is 88 to 92 FM, mm-hmm. um, at the princely power rating of 10 watts. Yeah. Uh, the FCC mandated around 1980, 1981, that radio stations had to up their power to a minimum of something I think was still ridiculously low at that point, like 250 watts or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, there were only really two frequencies in the educational band where that could happen at that point. And the UNCG Board of Trustees, bless their hearts, kind of sat on their feet or sat on their hands. I'm not sure what metaphor I'm meaning to use it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and we didn't get one of the frequencies, basically. Wow. There had been a lot of discussion up to that point about turning the student radio station into an NPR affiliate that would be you know, that would okay. be all news and public affairs and NPR stuff. Um, when they couldn't get one of those two frequencies, A&T and Guilford College grabbed those two frequencies for WNAA and WQFS, respectively, mm-hmm. 
that sort of ended that dream for the Board of Trustees. So in a way it was kind of a good thing for the radio station because uh, if they were only going to be able to stay low wattage like that, the Board of Trustees didn't care. Mm -hmm. They figured there weren't any fundraising opportunities around a 10 watt radio station, so they didn't right. care. Right. Uh, what happened though is that um, they had to do a frequency change because they essentially had to find a frequency where they could operate at their 10 watts and not interfere with any other radio stations. Um, and they found that frequency at 106.1 FM. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was you know, a big branding, marketing change, as much of one as you can have with a college radio station. Right. And they signed on sometime in early 1982 as the Music 106. I was, this was bef slightly before I got there. Right. Uh, there were other things happening at the radio station around that same point, though. At a approximately the same time the radio station had arranged what a lot of people called it sort of unholy merger with the broadcast cinema department at UNCG. Mm -hmm. Up to that point it had been a purely student organization. Students worked there because they were interested, they wanted they were interested in the music. There were some broadcasting students obviously worked there, but it was mostly about the music. Mm -hmm. That's why people wanted to work at the radio station. This merger with the Broadcast Cinema Department meant that you could do internships and get course credit for working at the radio station, which definitely upped the level of professionalism a little bit, mm -hmm. but also brought in a lot of people who were not so much into the music, that were more into a commercial broadcasting phase. Right. So along that time, there was a lot of uh, antagonism between the music people and the broadcasting people who had sort of vastly different visions for what the station should become. Mm -hmm. It was unpleasant there for a little while. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the, the music people, and I was more or less one of the music people, Right. Uh, despite the fact that I was broadcast cinema major too. I was like, well, what's the point of having a campus radio station that sounds like a top 40 radio station? Right. We already have a top 40 radio station. Camp ra campus radio station needs to do something, needs to have like a bigger mission than that. Right. Um, there were also a lot of people on campus that said, well, a campus radio station doesn't play music that we like. They don't play popular music, which I would respond to things. You know, we, number one, we are a campus radio station. We have a responsibility to do something a little different. And you wouldn't listen to us even if we did play the right. music you like to begin with. And number two, we are a campus radio station, but no radio station is licensed to a campus. A radio station is licensed to a community, which means we have a broader responsibility to the community than just to the campus. Right. I think I went a little past where you wanted to go there, but... No, that's okay. Oh. I'm curious how, um, how you get music selections at the campus radio station. Do they have... Do you bring your own music? Do they have a library? Do they... How does that work? Well, that goes to the next rational continuation of the last question, actually, is uh, as far as my job. Uh, in my second year at UAG, or at the end of my freshman year, basically, I became the music director for the radio station, which meant I was responsible for all that. I was responsible for getting the music in, reporting back to the record labels, how things were doing, et cetera. Um, with campus radio stations, uh, in those days, I don't know how it works now, everything's different now, but in those days we actually worked directly with the record companies and they would send us music because um, college radio stations at that point even were really big at breaking new music. Right. That's kind of what we did. We right. broke REM, we broke the Violent Femmes, uh, we broke artists even like Duran Duran, which was originally considered to be kind of an alternative artist at the time. Mm -hmm. a, lot of the, a lot of the new wave stuff that, it's interesting, a lot of the stuff that people associate with the 80s and think were some of the biggest hits of the 80s actually were never top 40 hits in the 80s. Mm -hmm. They were things that were mostly pushed out by alternative radio stations that sort of became associated with the 80s, but not a whole lot of people were listening to in the actual 80s when they were new. Mm -hmm. um, the big, a big one that I think about for that is Blister in the Sun by the Violent right. Femmes. Yeah. There was no top 40 radio station in America that was playing Blister in the Sun. Right. And yeah, now it's on commercials, it's everywhere, right. et cetera. So um, it was one of the only times I think in, in American pop music history where the alternative 
sort of became the thing that people remembered the era for, even though it wasn't that popular at the time. Hmm. But back to music. So um, I would uh, I would work with record labels to get them to send us stuff, and then we did what was called a playlist, mm -hmm. which showed what we were playing, which we sent back out to the record companies to tell them what we were playing. One sort of thing that happened musically with the station during that time is there was a when I came in as music director, is also one of my best and oldest friends, Duncan Brown, came in as program director of the radio station. We both were sort of in the middle. We were interested in the music, but we still thought it would be great if the radio station could have a little bit more of a professional sound as well. Mm -hmm. Like I tell people, college radio DJs are a weird thing, and I, I've given lots of people advice on this over the years. Number one, you don't have to sound like you've been mainlining heroin before you go <laughs> on the air. You can sometimes sound excited or enthusiastic about the music you're playing. It's okay. Right. <laughs> and in those days before, you know, you had displays and metadata with you, displaying with your music, DJs would get on the air. And they wouldn't talk for an hour. And then at the end of that block, they'd back announce the last 47 <laughs> songs they'd played. Yeah, yeah, it was, they played this, and before that, this, and before that, we played this. And way back in 1967, when I started the set, <laughs> we, uh, you know, yeah. it was awful. And it sort of defeated the mission of college radio, I thought, too, because people didn't know what they were listening to. Mm -hmm. It's hard to promote new music if you can't figure out what the hell it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you have people calling in? We would have people. We had actually a pretty good audience, and um, you know, I stand by our decision. We probably went a little poppier than college radio stations generally did at that time. Mm -hmm. But by doing it that way and a little more professional sound, I think we made things a little more accessible for the audience, and we introduced a lot of people here to a lot of music that they wouldn't have heard otherwise. Right. By making it a little more accessible and digestible, did we go too far off the deep end? Going poppy sometimes, probably, but you could argue most other college radio stations went too far in the other direction to the point where you know, you'd be at the DJ's mercy for two hours. And if you got a bad DJ, it was hell to listen to. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, you know, like twenty-two minute prog rock songs from nineteen seventy-one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, so we formatted a little more tightly than a lot of college radio stations were doing. We thought we were building the format, the radio format of the future that may even have commercial potential, and danged if we weren't right. <laughs> By the 80s, you know, there were basically commercial stations, usually basically the format that we'd done at UAG in those years. Um, obviously, they didn't do it by copying us, but mm -hmm. we sort of knew where we were going, like WHFS in Washington or um, the original Live 105 in San Francisco and KROQ in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, they were basically doing sort of the same format that we were doing at UAG at that point. So awesome. Yeah, it made it more accessible. Um, so we tightened up a little. You asked about people bringing in their own music too. Mm -hmm. We did. Uh, we did let people bring in their own music. We wanted them to check with us first so that they weren't bringing in 22-minute prog rock songs from 1972. Right. But um, and we had certain DJs that we were tended to be more inclined to let them go off format than others sure. because they were doing great stuff. Um, I remember a guy, he still lives here in Greensboro, did the greatest show probably that was ever on UAG. His name was Raymond Tucker. Um, That's cool. So how many people did you have <laughs> who were DJs? I mean, I mean, what was like the... I would say probably 25, 30 wow. maybe. Uh, and we had an executive board of about five or six people. Um, a pretty big operation, really. Yeah. Um, we were in one, two, three, four rooms in Elliott Center, and then in 1984 we moved over to Taylor Building, mm -hmm. um, which is another interesting story, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, which had been in the works for a long time anyway, because that was where that was right. part of where Broadcast Cinema was at the time right. too. Um, so it was, yeah, it was definitely a fairly big operation. Um, you know, we were f fairly well funded. Um, we cheated and did things like you know, the the ten watt transmitter. Sometimes we'd pump it up to eighteen. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a pretty good signal coverage, actually. Yeah. You, know, you can get us pretty much anywhere in Greensboro. Um, we didn't have coverage like A and T and Guilford College did because yeah, they got their frequencies right. and were able to go up to 
I think QFS was at like 1,900 watts at that point. I don't know what A&T station was at then. Mm -hmm. but And then we moved into Taylor Theater and into much bigger facilities in 1984. That was a fun move. Mm -hmm. um, I look back, there's a pine needles photo feature on the radio station move. Uh-huh that was all shot during the day and it makes it look like I single-handedly moved the radio station because <laughs> apparently I was the only person that showed up for the photo shoot. Uh -huh. None of this was real. We moved most of those records in the <laughs> middle of the night. Okay. Uh, Duncan and I, I remember one night putting in a complete overnighter moving stuff back and forth from EUC yeah. to Taylor Theater, including furniture that we wanted that we weren't supposed to take out <laughs> of Elliott Center because we liked it. Right. Like my office couch. I will always have an office couch that I like. <laughs> Still do here in the library. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I don't, and I don't even remember doing that photo sh shoot for the pine needles either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, I saw. <laughs> but it, it happened. I saw it a, for the first time, honestly, just a couple of years ago <laughs> when I was working when we were digitizing that here in the library, and I'm like, that, that's me. that's me. When yeah. did I do that? <laughs> So the facilities were nicer in Taylor? Oh, they were great. Upgraded yeah, we, equipment? Yeah, we had a big new control room. We had a nice production studio. Instead of the old crumbling acoustical tile on the walls, we had carpeted walls. Everybody had their own office. We had mm -hmm. places to store stuff. Um, shortly after we moved, I became general manager of the radio station and had a much bigger office. It was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, there were some some growing pains. I remember the first the first... The first song we played after we moved in, when we went on the air, it was a Saturday afternoon. We cut off the tr signal from Elliot and turned it on. And they said and the first song we played was "New Toy" by Lena Lovitch, mm -hmm. which was kind of perfect in those days for us to do. Um, but there were weird things like at Elliot Center, there was a key checkout system, mm -hmm. uh, and you had to actually, sh you know, if you were there after the building closed, you had to show them you had a key to get out. Right. Uh, it was different in Taylor because you could get out, but you couldn't get in. Uh -huh. So, you know, we had, there were some weird issues with getting in and out of the building in the middle of the night. Right. Um, but generally, yeah, it was, it was pretty nice once we moved over there. Um, and, you know, and get, in the last couple of years, they moved again now, and they're in the Brown Building into just this, like, they have like a whole floor now. It's just massive. Wow. I can't, I'm imagine why they would need that much space but when I went over there uh, working with them on a project a couple of years ago they took me in the record room uh -huh. the first thing I saw of course was two albums from 1984 with my handwriting on them <laughs> from when I'd reviewed them for when we played them on the air when they were new awesome which both excited and horrified me <laughs> <laughs> so do you still listen today to the campus radio stations I do I do sometimes yeah it's uh Philosophically, I like it a lot more now because it's a lot more diverse. Mm -hmm. We weren't very diverse at that point, you know. Uh -huh. Our sure. our sort of concession, if you will, even to African American students, is that we had the jazz block every day from six to eight. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I think back in horror. Yeah, we were trying to format that the way we formatted all the other stations, saying, "Well, this is what jazz is." This is, and you know. I kind of get horrified at the way I know a lot of us at the radio station were sort of white splaining what jazz is at that right, point, right. and it just makes me cringe thinking about it. Right. Um, I like that the radio station is a lot more diverse now, a lot more different theme type shows. It makes it a little harder to listen to because you never quite know what you're going to get, which is kind of interesting also too. Good, yeah. But sometimes if what you get is not what you're interested in, you might not want to listen for right. that long. But um, right. But I philosophically, I like the radio station in a lot of ways a lot more than I liked it when we were there. Yeah, that's great. Because, um, you know, I, what, I really can't... It bothered me about the baby boom generation that was right before me, and I'm starting to see the same thing with my own generation now. People th who think that all new and interesting music stopped when they were 25 years old. Right. Here's a clue. It didn't. I mean, most of the stuff I listen to now actually... Is either from before I was born or from the last ten years or so. Yeah. You know, I listen. Actually, I listen to a lot of Canadian indie rock now, but <laughs> there's a different story too. Right. But you know, I listen to a lot of new music. I still go to see bands. Mm -hmm. um, that and listen to Ella Fitzgerald on the side too. Right. And oddly enough, I can't listen to a lot of music from the early '80s anymore. The indie stuff I like, but all that 
techno pop new wave stuff from the early mm -hmm. 80s is like nail fingernails on a chalkboard to me now even though it used to be so much of what we played in those right. days all right is there anything else we want to talk about about the uh wag experience I just want to say one last time with a microphone next to me, WUAG, the music 106. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I miss it. Sometimes I want to be a DJ again, but mm -hmm. yeah. They might have guest slots. They never know. You know. <laughs> so, do we want to talk about any conflicts with SGA or um, broadcast cinema? Uh, we talked a little about that. Yeah, you you know, there was sort of the conflict. Um, uh, the, the radio station had initial before the broadcast cinema stuff had originally been funded and managed by a group called the University Media Board. Mm -hmm. There were th at that point there were three big student organization oversight groups. There was the University Media Board, which oversaw the newspapers, the newspaper uh, Karate, which was the literary magazine, and. Um, the yearbook mm -hmm. and the radio station. Uh, there was the EUC Council, which was a lot of the sort of more social events uh, that were handled, Elliott Center, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there was student government, which also oversaw more student focused campus organizations, um, which we'll talk about probably a little more later when we get down to the Gay and Lesbian Student Association. Mm -hmm. um, Radio station was financed and managed through the University Media Board pri prior to the Broadcast Cinema merger. Uh, at that point, they set up something called the University Station Advisory Board or something that was part Broadcast Cinema people, part student representatives. There was always some conflict between them and the University Media Board and student government because, you know, you don't like to give up something you used to have control over. Right. Um, and I remember at one point too, the radio station went to student government to uh, ask for fund for special appropriation for something. And there was a lot of discussion about, well, can we even do that now? Uh, mm -hmm. I think ultimately they did, and I forget what it was for. Um, it might have been the stolen records. There was a big stolen records issue in 1982. Uh, there was a DJ who actually apparently over Thanksgiving weekend just made off with tons and tons of albums uh -huh. out of the radio station. I remember that specifically because the program director of the radio station at that point, who will remain, remain nameless, but I hated her. <laughs> I went to junior high and didn't hate her in junior high, but I hated her as the program manager of the radio station because she was awful. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, accused me of it. Uh -huh. I was like, don't even start. Because um, I had a key to the station because I was right. on the air over the, course, over the weekend. Um, but uh, eventually that person was found and was oh, arrested good. and we got a lot of the stuff back. We also, though, got some emergency money to buy a bunch of new stuff in oh, the process, great. too. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, we could then use to buy new stuff rather than replace some of the stuff that had been stolen. So. Right. Well, so you were in, involved with SGA as well, right? I was pretty much from, from day one just because I met all the SGA people that summer before. Okay. Uh, that was a big summer for me in general. You know, I was going through a lot of changes. I sort of ditched all my high school friends that I didn't like and sort of built this whole new circle of friends, many of them I'm still friends with at awesome. UNCG. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was originally a town student senator. Um, Committee-wise, I ended up uh, at various points on the Classification of Organizations Committee. <laughs> that sounds exciting. That was actually the, it was actually a very pivotal committee. Okay. As a, now, you got to understand, kitty politics at UNCG, we took this stuff so deadly seriously. I mean, it's embarrassing now how yeah. seriously we took this stuff. Yeah. But classification of organizations was responsible for deciding what student organizations student government would recognize and thus what student organizations they would fund. Yeah, right. Uh, with the Neo Black Society controversy in the 70s. That had been the issue with them is that the Classification of Organizations Committee wanted to strip their recognition because they thought they were too political or were uh, limiting membership, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right. So, you know, they played a fairly important role right. uh, and would later play a big role with GLSA as well, mm -hmm. uh, the Gay and Lesbian Student Association. Uh, I was also on the Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So I guess I was a good person to know if you had a campus organization right, because I was on the, the committee that, that recognized you and then on the committee that decided how much money you got after you recognized. Right, so. right. So how did you, did you say this, you met these people in the summer, what was going on? Was this music related? Or we were just all hanging out in the hall together pretty okay. much. You know? okay. The student government people would come down to the radio station and say, can you play so and so? Because they had offices down the hall. Right, the that's right, same um, floor. Yeah. There were a lot, you know, um, and the student government people generally tended to be music, interest, interested in good music as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we all got along and were awesome. really cozy there for a while. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and we'd play record frisbee down the hall. <laughs> with, um, with not the favorite record. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Anything else about SGA you want to talk about right now? Uh, SGA was interesting. I mean, we, talk, we took it so deathly seriously at the time. Um, but it was fun too. I mean, we we had a page. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, we would pass notes to each other during Senate. <laughs> the page would be running across <laughs> the room, giving people notes. And yeah, they usually were not notes about anything other than some snarky comment about right. whoever was talking at right. the time. Uh, I still have a lot of those notes. They're kind of fun to go back and read <laughs> now, but I would not share them with anybody because, yeah. <laughs> But um, we did. I think we did a lot of thing. A lot of things. Yeah, we uh, some of the big accomplishments we had during that year, or we established what was called the Student Escort Service, which mm -hmm. actually would accompany students around campus at night. Um, you know, to give a feeling of safety. For example, sure. um, we recognized a lot of organizations, um, the Gay and Lesbian Student Association being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was on. Class classification of organizations committee when we did that recognition, and also on the appropriations committee, um, that was not a universally popular decision, as you might imagine, particularly here in the early '80s. And yeah, I don't. Um, UNCG at that time, though there were a lot of gay students, it was not really out. Kind mm -hmm. of, I guess the way I was out, even you know, right. I I was sort of pretty well out when I first got here. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that if you want If you want to go into that and okay. tell me what the environment was like for, for gay men uh, during your time here. This is early 80s and 90s. Sort of closety. <laughs> yeah. um, I was unusually, I basically threw, threw the closet door slammed behind me leaving splinters uh, as I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. and I started telling people in high school. Um, so basically, when I got to UNCG that summer, it was already a thing. You know, it was like, you met me. Oh, it was actually kind of annoying. Hi, I'm David. I'm a homosexual. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I was a little obnoxious about it at that right. point. But that says something that you were comfortable enough with yourself <laughs> and with the campus to be able to do that. Yeah, because I was tired of this shit. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like I've been... It's, um, I was unusual in that I was that out and open right. at that point. Um, it was not. There were a lot of there were there were out people here. I mean, it's the '80s, and we're not talking about the '60s when people mm -hmm. were being thrown in jail just for saying the word "gay." Right. So you know, I mean, it was it was a much more comfortable place than it had been ten or twenty years earlier. But it was not the place that it is now. Right. And even I wasn't entirely comfortable with some aspects of things you know i think i was i was intim i was really intimidated by gay people when i was 18 or 19 years old they a lot of the people i met sort of gave me the lens i think it was because i'd sort of bought into the fact that you know they were all these bar hopping sex monsters mm -hmm. because yeah that's what you get told right when you're growing up here um at that point in time uh, it was a little pre-aids at that point i mean it was a thing but it was not a thing we were hearing about a lot for a couple of years here mm -hmm. but um you know i was sort of intimidated i didn't go to gay bars for my first couple of years even though i could have because mm -hmm. to start with i didn't want to and i still don't particularly like gay bars because they play crummy music and have expensive, you were at the music bars you were at the, yeah i mean they play the crummy music, music they have expensive drinks um until recently, they've always had awful, awful beer. I mean, like Bud Light might be the best you could go. And some because gay people don't drink beer. Well, yeah, they do. But 
Um, yeah, I went through a period where I went to bars a lot, but um, yeah, I'm all, I've a gay bar would never be my first choice of where to go and hang out in a town because you know they're kind of awful, <laughs> most of them. Uh-huh. But um, you know, sort of intimidated by that scene, and you know, I I was a person a lot of people sought out in those days, you know, because I was so open. I was. You know, obviously, I was the person everybody came out to first. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people I've been the first person they told they were gay. Right. Um, Just because I was out. I was there. I wasn't trying to be a role model. Lord knows (laughs) I wasn't a good role model, even if I was trying to be. But... um, but then it says something about you as a person, too, that they trust you and they feel comfortable. All with that, you. and it says something about, you know, the culture is like, oh, my God, there's somebody that's out and open that I can talk to. Because there weren't a whole lot of people. There right. were a couple of faculty members, but they were having their own troubles at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, Kenneth Crump's suicide in 1982. You, did you, what was that like being on campus when that happened? Well, I knew Kenneth Crump. Mm-hmm. He was actually a fr- it was actually a friend of mine, actually... Uh, I vaguely remember that one of our woman friends had tried to fix us up at some point. And we were mm-hmm. like, oh, no, that's not going to happen. We're, <laughs> we are so not each other's type. <laughs> but um, hey, he was a nice guy. You know, he was sort of in the circle of friends I hung out with. Um, it was very surprising to me when it happened. I mean, I found out about the, you know, about the next day when I came onto campus. Mm-hmm. Um, it was... It was surprising. It was kind of horrifying. I knew that there had been some problems. About a year before that, there had been a lot of issues in Strong Hall, which was a kind of a freshman and sophomore men's dormitory mm-hmm. at that time. There had been a lot of anti-gay issues going on there. And I think, as I remember, I think he lived in Strong mm-hmm. and had gone through that. I feel like he got a lot of harassment here at UNCG. I don't know that that's the primary reason that he committed suicide. I mean, We'll never know. You never know why somebody right. commits suicide. Um, I think that played into it. I think he had his own personal issues going on as well. But I think the harassment he faced, and probably I don't, I don't, I never really knew what his situation was with his parents. I don't know if that played mm-hmm. into it or not. But I mean, it was horrifying. You know? It would be horrifying anybody if anybody committed suicide on a, what was at that point a smaller campus where you mm-hmm. knew people and. Yeah, you, know, you could walk by the library every day and see where they boarded up the window where he jumped out of it. So it was like that was, yeah, that was a little awful. And you know, there were there were the odd person on campus that made jokes about it here and there. Right. Um, generally, I think it was handled fairly sensitively here on campus. Uh, you know, if you read the accounts of the day. There's nothing mentioned about him being gay. I think right. uh, in the Carolinian, there's one letter to the editor that references it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was written by another friend of our of mine, but yeah, there wasn't a lot of reference. There was not the outcry of this gay person was treated horribly on campus. And I don't know if it's. I mean, the administration may well not have known. I can't imagine that they didn't, but the administration may not have known what was going on or that he was gay. Mm-hmm. But it was it was an awful thing because he was a friend. I mean. We weren't tight, good friends, but we, you know, we'd hung out. We mm-hmm. always, we, he was in a group I hung out with a lot. We talked a lot, um, yeah. and I was surprised because I didn't know things were that bad for him. Right. Well, that's often the case with people with suicide. Yeah. You, you don't realize. Um, Unfortunately, you know, one of the issues with depression is an inability to do anything about your depression. Right. Right. Been there. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to talk about discrimination, anti-discrimination activity aimed at the LGBT community that was taking place during this time. Um, there's lots of things going on. Uh, there's the Cracker Barrel incidents, the uh, Greensboro City Council, um, UNCG's sexual orientation, non-discrimination calls battle. Uh, any particular, any of these that particularly stand out to you that you'd like to talk about? Well, they're kind of two different eras for me. The first, right. the, the non-discrimination thing was early on for me. Actually, in 1983, we, um, I was one of the co-sponsors. We submitted a resolution to the chancellor requesting uh, that UNCG uh, add non-discrimination language mm-hmm. 
to its whatever you add non-discrimination language to at the so time. Policy statements. Yeah. Policy statements. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and not surprisingly, uh, from Dr. Moran and 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 and, and Mossman, crickets. Lots of crickets. <laughs> we didn't hear anything back right. from that. Basically, it was not a thing that they wanted to do at that point. I know that it did happen later on. There was yeah. controversy around it, but it didn't happen when we were requesting it in 1983 because I think it was too sensitive. Um, I was. Um, I do remember. Um, about a two a year maybe two years after we had uh, recognized the uh, gay and lesbian student association there was a lot of controversy from one senator about their appro their funding appropriation uh, i think this was like 1985 um, so sh uh, it was starting in my last semester here the first time and then sort of came to a head right after i left mm -hmm. um, there was a senator who was from davie county he was extremely conservative he later became you know a jesse helms district campaign person um right confederate veterans member uh, it was he was not a pleasant guy um but he uh tried to hold up the appropriate the appropriation via a lot of delaying tactics by sort of trying to hijack the Senate, using profanity at some points, using offensive language. And I think he original, they, he actually came up for impeachment as a senator. Oh. <laughs> that shows you how seriously we took our kitty politics in those days. Yeah. Uh, he ended up only getting reprimanded. He was not impeached. Yeah. But, um, and you know, there was a lot of support behind, I imagine there was a lot of support for his position because there were probably a lot of people that didn't want their student activity fees going to fund this perversion mm -hmm. or whatever it was um later you know this and then you know i left here and moved away came back and came back to school in 89 uh there were different issues at that point you know um the whole aids thing had happened mm -hmm. <laughs> largely while i was gone um and a lot of the activism or a lot of the uh, discrimination was centered around that ultimately aids became a very convenient way to excuse discrimination that you would have been practicing mm -hmm. even absent AIDS. Right. It's like, oh, we don't like gay people and now we've got this thing we can use against them because they're all diseased and they're going to kill us. Right. Um, so it was very convenient mm -hmm. at that point, uh, particularly as there was also a much more conservative tone to the country right. thanks to the Reagan, Reagan years. Yeah. Though oddly enough, he never mentioned AIDS until Rock Hudson got it, but <laughs> don't get me started on that. But, you know, there's other discrimination going on here, too. Uh, the Cracker Barrel thing that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we're all familiar with Cracker Barrel, the chain mm -hmm. of eight meals for seven ninety nine billboards mm -hmm. around the country, the Cracker Barrel Old Country Store. Well, in, uh, I think, late 1990 or early 1991, um, they fired one of their people for being gay and then very express, very explicitly said that their employment policies permitted hiring only people who exhibited, and this is a quote, normal heterosexual values. Right. I mean, they weren't just <laughs> discriminating on the table. They were saying, yes, we discriminate. We don't want these fags in our restaurant. Right. Um, that didn't go over well. There was sort of a new wave of activism happening at that point anyway. In larger cities, that was when you were starting to see a lot of the direct action groups like ACT UP and Queer Nation. Mm -hmm. Queer Nation had a chapter in Atlanta. Cracker Barrel had a lot of restaurants in Atlanta. Protests ensued. Mm -hmm. There were sit-ins. There were it was it was big stuff. Um, and in fact, there were some suggestions that Atlanta, I think, had a non-discrimination policy in effect for mm -hmm. city services at that point. So there were questions as to whether Cracker Barrel could even discriminate in Atlanta. Apparently, they were able to successfully. Right. But um, and it spread up here as well. Um, there's the Cracker Barrel out on Wendover Avenue, um, and we had to sit in there one morning. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to go to Cracker Barrel anymore. <laughs> uh, I did go to that sit-in um, with a f friend of mine from work, um, and you know, basically, it was it was your standard sit-in. You go in there, 
you sit and the way you, that was done at that point is you off you order something like a glass of water and say you're waiting for someone else to join you at your mm -hmm. table pretty soon they realized that they had a lot of people waiting for someone <laughs> to join them at their tables at their busy time which was basically sunday at noon right um, and at that point, they asked us to leave. Now, you said we. Was this part of a It was, it was a big organization. I forget the name of the group that, okay. set, that set it up. Uh, I've got an article somewhere. I, hope okay. I could look it up for you. But um, there was an organized group that I was not a part of. I knew about it. Um, I was sort of a lazy activist. I would join in <laughs> protests fine. that other people established. I wasn't... I looked at... I thought my personal life, every day, my interactions were, were activism enough, right. uh, yeah, which, you, uh, which, which is on, a good cop out. Yeah. <laughs> but you do, joined in on this to participate. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had to sit in, then we had a picket outside afterwards, and yeah, there was there were a lot of people. It, well, that was still when you were worried about being on the news and having your face shown holding an anti-gay picket sign. Right. Now I'd been through that before because I'd done like some act up stuff in Columbia, South Carolina, where I'd been on where there's news coverage as well. Um, it didn't worry me that much because you know I had a pretty good relationship with my parents at that point, and who else was I going to worry about? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like work, school, everybody knew right. at that point. I didn't care. Right. Um, and, yeah, my parents, it was a weird thing with my parents. I never had to come out to my parents. It's just yeah. one day we sort of all realized we knew what was going on and moved on from there. We never had to have the conversation or anything. Mm -hmm. it's just, was that sort of, in high school as well? No, this was actually later on. I was in my 20s, I think. Oh, okay. But, um, but yeah, there was that. Uh, the Greensboro City Council thing uh, also, I think, was around 1990, as I remember. I could be off, give or take a year or two. But the City Council passed a non-discrimination ordinance. It was not a sweeping non-discrimination ordinance. It was just because you know Charlotte tried to do that a couple of years ago and still wasn't able to, and right. that's what got us into HB2. Right. But um, it passed an ordinance saying that for our internal hiring practices we will have a non-discrimination policy. Then a couple of days later went back and um, rescinded that. Yeah, they were pressured I guess. Right? Yeah, so there was, there was a lot of uh, activism attending city council meetings and demonstrations about that as well too. I think those are the, the two big demonstrations I remember. We had a lot of benefits, that kind of thing. A lot of, a lot, there was a lot of music involvement. A lot of bands were doing AIDS and at that sure. point free speech benefits because there was a lot of issues just surrounding free speech in general um, you know not just pornography which is a lot of people what a lot of people think about the free speech movement in mm -hmm. the early 90s but free speech in general uh, for students that type of thing I, I remember there was one man I for some reason, I'm thinking the DBs were at it. Uh, there's all kinds of. There's a, a big thing, or but I may be confusing that with a DBs reunion concert in Charlotte around the same time. But lots of local bands were involved in in, in, in these assorted benefits for kind of lefty causes. Okay. Um, yeah, I've always felt that Greensboro. Uh, you know, with exceptions, was a much more gay-friendly place than a lot of other cities in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, even bigger cities, even say so like mm -hmm. even bigger than say Charlotte, um, which may or may not still be the case. A, a lot of people seem to still think it is, and I don't disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you think that is? What makes you think that? Uh, I think it's a lot of the reason that Greensboro can be a little more liberal than Charlotte in a lot of ways, and. This was particularly true back in the 80s, I think, is that the colleges are a bigger part of the mix here, mm -hmm. uh, whereas you know, Charlotte is banker town, mm -hmm. yep. Republican banker town. Right. Nothing wrong with Republicans, except the platform. At the, um, <laughs> But there are five colleges and universities in Greensboro. Yeah, there are much, proportionately, a much bigger part of the mix here. Yeah. And yeah, UNCG also being traditionally an art school, or what you know later on we would come to refer to as the creative class. I really hate that term. Um, UNCG being big on that too, it tended to be a, you know, a particularly liberal university. Mm -hmm. So.
Right. Um, yeah, I, I feel, yeah, there were, there have been a lot of anti-gay things that have happened here, particularly the purge back in the, in the 50s around Commerce Place and the bus station, mm. um, which is something a lot of cities did in those days. Um, mm. Later on, there was controversy here on UNCG campus and a lot of other campuses about people who would cruise in the basement of the library or the basement of Elliott Center. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and th that was a big thing when I was here as an undergrad. You know, it's not a thing that happens anymore because, mm -hmm. you know, like so many things in the world, it's been replaced by an app. But um, <laughs> that was a thing that happened then. And there was a certain subset of men who may or may not really have identified as gay that were involved in that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like either, you know, I'm not going to say it was just closeted people that didn't have any other option. There were a lot of really out gay men that, that did that whole scene because they thought they met a more interesting class of people, if you will. Right. Well, met may be the wrong word here. Right. Um, but, um, you know, there's always going to be a subset of gay men who have a fetish for men who don't identify as gay. Sure. And you felt like you'd meet people that way. Um, you know, UNCG, I don't think, was ever hyperactive on the enforcement of the term is tea rooms, by the way. Um, oh, okay. um, there was actually a book written in the 60s by a sociologist called Laud Humphreys called Tea Room Trade mm. um, that was about you know, soliciting or meeting for sex in public restrooms, that kind of thing. Um, okay. Interesting book. Raised a lot of ethical sociological questions, too. But um, which he was really generally sympathetic, but there were still some ethical questions. But, um, you know, there's... A, there's that was a big thing at UNCG, and it's a, it's a thing that if you're talking about gay history at UNCG, you can't really ignore because it was such a big thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think UNCG was ever as aggressive with the enforcement on that as some other colleges, and particularly places like malls, mm -hmm. where right. it would also happen. Right. Okay. I'm not sure where we drifted off into that from, but <laughs> I think it flowed pretty well. Okay, <laughs> but I do want to talk about if, unless there's anything else you want to talk about in that area. Not right off hand. Eventually, okay. I left it all, moved to San Francisco, where everything was drastically different. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about San Francisco at all? Not really. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I can if you want to. I mean, San Francisco. Sure. I loved it for about six or seven years. It was exactly the place I needed to go. I was an only child. I needed to move to the other end of the country to kind of become myself right. in a lot of ways. San Francisco was a good, San Francisco in the nineties was a pretty amazing place to do that because it was still recessionary and you could still afford to move to San mm. Francisco and live there working at Kinkos. Yeah, uh, you can't do that now. Yeah. I was looking online at my old apartment from San Francisco, and it rents for four thousand dollars a month now. <laughs> and it was a hovel. I mean, it's now a more nicely flipped hovel. But still, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but it was a great place to be. Um, you know, it was. I will never say bad things about having moved to San Francisco. I didn't like it so much by the time I left. Right. But it was an experience because it had changed a lot, and so had I. But it was an right. experience I wouldn't have missed. I lived there thirteen years. You know, and it did. Yeah. If you want to be out and open, San Francisco obviously yeah. is the place to do it, or was at the time. I don't know that it really is anymore, but right. it was at the time. All right. Well, let's talk about what you brought, what brought you back or happened when you came back. Um, you eventually came back to UNCG, right? So I did. For your MLIS, your Master's in Library Science. Mm -hmm. uh, and you received that in 2009. Can you tell me what happened in your life to make you think, Hey, this is something I want to do, or this is a viable career path, or San Francisco. <laughs> um, now, well, um, yeah, it actually does figure into it. In San Francisco, yeah, that was where I met the one, my one long-term life partner. Um, we were together for ten, almost ten years. Um, we actually were among the couples that that got married in that civil disobedience thing in San Francisco on Valentine's Day weekend in two thousand four. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those weddings were all invalidated. We never actually did it officially anywhere mm -hmm. else after that because you know, even in that case, it was more about the civil disobedience than right. 
because uh, yeah, it didn't seem something we needed to do since it wasn't going to be recognized where we lived anyway. Right. Uh, but about that point, I was ready to get out of San Francisco. I was done with it. Um, my partner had been born and raised in Fresno. I think he wanted something different too. So we left. We moved back to North Carolina in 2005. I had no idea what I was going to do when I got back here. I was freelancing, doing web design. So yeah, that was there was income from that. Um, and um, <clears throat> my ex ultimately ended up in this weird sort of hybrid telecommuting thing where he was going back and forth from North Carolina to San Francisco mm -hmm. for most of the time we were together here. But um, we moved back originally to Charlotte and moved to Winston-Salem in 06 and bought a house. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I finally said, I got to do something. This is not working. I need to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. Um, and I sort of knew where I was going to head with this because I'd been... Uh, Oddly enough, supermarkets sent me to <laughs> sent me to to librarianship. It was about you know I was doing I was doing web stuff early on in San Francisco. Um, I started doing websites in 1996, mm -hmm. which was before a good chunk of America knew what a website was. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was my one area to be an early adopter in, I guess. Um, and I was doing a personal website starting around 1999 because I'd always been interested in the history of supermarkets and supermarket chains. Go figure, I don't know why. Um, it fits in well with geography and history. Yeah, and over the years, really, it did. Once I started researching them, it became kind of an obsession because I mostly did, I was doing architectural research on them, you know, on the building types. But then and I also started concentrating mostly on location research. So over time, where the chains had located, mm -hmm. which is a really neat way to uh, follow urban development patterns mm -hmm. in a city. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been doing that ever since. Um, I found myself doing research in a lot of libraries and also in archives right. and also using a lot of digitized online resources. And I thought, you know, I'd been working in web design and had been working for the company currently known as FedEx Office, formerly known as Kinko's for years. So imaging was a right. thing that, you know, document manipulation was a thing I had a background in too. And I said, you know, there's probably a profession in here somewhere. So I went to library school here at UNCG starting in 2007. I very specifically went into the program knowing that what I wanted to do coming out of it was to digitize historical materials. Mm. Very good. Yeah. I had, that was my thing, that was what I wanted to do. And I was lucky enough that I was able to go in. There wasn't really a lot in the program at that point on doing that. So I was sort of able to develop my own program going through library school, which I really appreciate from the LIS department here is that they allowed that freedom and flexibility. flexibility yeah. So I was able to kind of create my own program, worked a lot with the university libraries too, actually, you know, despite the fact that I was 45 years old or 44 years old, I, I did the student worker thing in the library mm -hmm. working in the digitization lab because there are some dues that you have to pay to get into a position. And that was some of the dues I had to pay. And fortunately, you know, I was I, I had the flexibility in my life with mm -hmm. a, an understanding partner at the time was able to, to do that and work some of those opportunities. I also did some internships and volunteer works with the public library, and the historical museum. Mm -hmm. And as luck would have it, I was in the right place at the right time, and I got a job here at the UNCG library managing the unit that digitizes historical material and puts them online. So, you know, it was sort of a magic ABC after school special kind Everything of... Everything fell into place. <laughs> kind of an end, yeah. yeah. You know, I felt like Christy McNichol after her boyfriend kicked drug addiction or something, <laughs> you know, it's like everything worked out the way it was supposed to, mm -hmm. supposed to, yeah. and pretty painlessly. And of course then, yeah, my ex and I split up and Everything got weird after that, but right. uh, and but, so what, what but is work your, was good. Yeah, and so what is your job now? <laughs> I am currently the digital projects coordinator, um, which is a sort of misleading title because it seems to suggest that I do anything related to digital projects at all, which is not strictly to my department does digitization. We digitize primary source material archival material, print materials, 
to place them online specifically, um, as opposed to say digital humanities, which works with tools that use these materials, or digital collections, which means you know I'm managing library databases, maybe that kind of thing. Um, we actually digitize and make materials available, and I do work a lot with the digital humanities people as well. So because you know, obviously mm -hmm. I'm trying to work with people who want to develop tools using materials. They need the materials to work with. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's my job's really interesting. I get to do a lot of a lot of different and varied stuff every day. I've been doing this for almost ten years now, and I still absolutely love my job. Yeah, that's I mean, great. It's, and after many, many years of having jobs that I absolutely despised and hated, <coughs> retail kinkos, um, <laughs> it's really nice to go to work and love your. I mean, yeah, not everything is perfect every day of the week. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's drama, there's politics, it's academia, there's always going to be drama and politics because mm -hmm. that's kind of what we do. But generally, I still absolutely love my job. That's great, and you're very good at it. You help us a lot. So, um, do you want to talk about some of the projects and things you've worked on? Uh, that are maybe your, some of your proudest accomplishments that you've done since you've been in this position? I don't know if there are specific projects that excite me so much as sort of the body, the large body of stuff that we've gotten online. Um, what I am particularly proud of is that we've developed a lot of working relationships with other schools and colleges and museums mm -hmm. and the public library here in Greensboro and are starting to look out and have more of a regional focus to what we do. Um, which interestingly enough, I always think kind of goes back to when I was working at the radio station. You know, I thought the radio station is part of the university, but it serves a larger community mm -hmm. and has a, a mission that's based on that community. And I kind of think that University libraries have that same responsibility, not just to their campus, but to their larger communities. Mm -hmm. And of course, it helps that it's also a personal interest of mine to work with local history, obviously. But I feel like you know we've we've built a lot of relationships in the community, um, and we're doing something. You know, we have a larger focus than just the internal library community. We're trying to make something that's more accessible to the region and with some projects we've worked on recently now you know a lot of the like a lot of the work that my unit has done and that the larger work that other units in the library like our uh, development team have done with slavery related materials are really important and are being used on a nationwide and kind of global scale mm -hmm. um, I've only been a small part of that mm -hmm. um, a lot of that came out of a partnership with our lead developer here at UNCG and uh, uh, emeritus faculty member in the history department. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I've worked with that a lot to some extent too, and I'm working with uh, with uh, Richard Cox and our development team on a grant now to digitize other materials where we're actually working with uh, registers of deeds statewide. So, right. you know, I think that's that's a project to be proud of just because it's getting so much usage nationwide. The Slave Ads project, which my unit specifically did, actually was was actually used in Colson Whitehead's recent book, mm -hmm. uh, The Underground Railroad. He referenced us and thanked us, and I give him credit for that. Very nice, yeah. Um, because, you know, a lot of people don't. Right. So that was pretty cool. And, and, nice we, and as that, you know, he actually was able to come on campus and yeah. speak about it as well. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like you know, we're having a little a little larger impact. Um, but yeah, mainly I just like to get stuff online so people can use it. Um, and yeah, I feel like you know, I've used a lot of other people's stuff online. So yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. this is this is my way to give back to the library or the history or genealogy or whatever community mm -hmm. you want to speak of. Right. Right. Uh, so maybe you could. Talk about how the library's changed since your undergraduate years. I assume you went to the library in your undergraduate years. I went to the library a lot in my undergraduate years. I was, yeah. I was a good library person, guy, thing. Patron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the basement of the library is a whole lot less creepy now than it was yeah. even when I was in grad school. I, I will say that. Yes. Um, I think the library is 
a radically different place than it was 30, 35 years ago. The big difference now is that there are people in it. Mm -hmm. There weren't really a lot of people in the library, when, particularly up in the stacks. Mm -hmm. um, in the tower part of the library when I was an undergrad, which is why you know a friend of mine could nap up there in 1982 and not really be noticed and then be able to jump right. out the window and commit suicide right. that night. Um, there were a lot of people up in the stacks. Yeah. Um, now the library is full of people. It's, it's, it's amazing how different it is, how crowded it is. Yeah. The library is, I think, a more important part of student life now than it was 30 years ago. And you know, obviously it's not about books anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the books are nice. I like the books. Students aren't looking at the books. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the books. So what do you books. think has brought, <laughs> brought people into the library? I think it's just a good communal workspace. I think we have we in the library have been really good in, at listening and observing what student wa students want and trying to give it to them. Mm -hmm. um, they want workspace. They want good computers. Um, and they want collaborative workspaces, spaces where they can work together. Some of them also want really quiet spaces, and we try to accommodate those as well. But, you know, it's not a shh library like uh, a lot are um, but I mean they want yeah we've got the uh, digital media commons now where they can work with um, scanning photography gaming mm -hmm. um, that's what makes the basement less creepy now yeah. <laughs> when I was <laughs> when I was in grad school the library science stacks were in the basement and it was this weird little sort of hobbit maze back mm -hmm. there uh, it was impossible to find anything except that you kind of expected around every corner you were going to find a dead body or something. Yeah. It was just it was creepy down yeah, there. Yeah, it's much more open now, light, yeah. uh, not as many shelving units everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of regret seeing the books go away because, you know, I like the books. I still buy books. Books are good. But I understand that that's sort of not where it's going right now. And I think if we can strike a medium, a balance between, you know, the books and that, um, that's good. And I think now with our concentration on special collections and university archives in particular, we're more focused on what I think is probably a more important collecting area for physical materials now, because we're looking to collect unique things, mm -hmm. not books that every other university has a copy of as well. Right. We're looking to collect history and things that are specific to our institution. And I think that's kind of where where it's going now, right. yeah, and you know, I'd like to digitize a lot of that stuff yeah. too. Yeah, um, we I'd would like for you to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, so much nicer for researchers, uh, even if they eventually come in and see the real thing too. It's nice that they can see it online as well. And yeah, I think early in digitization there was a lot of worry that's like, oh, you're going to digitize everything and then throw it all away. No. no, I've never never advocated throwing anything away. Well, I mean, if it's a book that there are a thousand copies of in a thousand libraries, maybe you could get rid of that. But mm -hmm. I, don't, I would never, I, I'm upset at all the things that were thrown away when they were microfilmed 50 years ago. That mm -hmm. That's right. just awful that, that happened. And I think, yeah, I think early on, I think people realize it more now, but early on there wasn't this recognition that if you have collections digitized, it actually tends to raise the visibility of your archives right. and bring more traffic to your other collections. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's not like we're in competition here. No, I don't see it that way either. <laughs> no. um, speaking of getting people into the library, I mean, what do you think about the connector? You talked about that earlier. Uh, we also had some policy changes, like food policy changes that mm -hmm. probably have helped. Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, yeah. it's like the the connector is a big thing now. It's I think it that may have been the smartest thing they did to integrate the library into the into the bigger campus because it was kind of a pain to get from EUC to the library because you had mm -hmm. to go around three corners up four flights of stairs. It was mm -hmm. the library's always been kind of hard to enter from that side of campus, right? And it actually you know added a door. Mm -hmm. which meant you didn't have to go around to the front portico on College door. Avenue. Yeah, an accessible door as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it meant that if you were in EUC eating and needed to go by the library, it was a thing. And yeah, yes, obviously a lot of people use it as a cut through mm -hmm. from one end of campus to the other, but those people are in that process, cutting through the library, being in the library, 
seeing what's in the library and getting familiar with being there. So even the cut through traffic, I don't think is a bad thing. No, definitely I think not. it's a I think it's a great thing because it's. I agree with you. Yeah, and maybe it's just you know coming coming out of retail as my background. And I think you know building traffic. You know, yeah, you don't sell anything to the just looking people, but you might eventually. Yeah. Yeah, on their way to the CAF or the EUC, they might yeah. see a service they didn't know we had or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, I think in recent years, too, our specifically <coughs> our special collections and archives, I'm really happy with the way that that has more opened up to people because people were just scared <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I got there, we used yeah. to have closed doors. Yeah. yeah, that's another policy change, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah, it, that's so much more yeah. open, and there's so much more outreach coming out of that whole area of the library now, too, and that, yeah. that makes me happy. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to move on to the conclusions portion. Uh, I'll give you a chance at the end to add anything else if you want to add anything else. Okay. But uh, can you tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you? Well, I just keep coming back like a bad penny. <laughs> I don't really know what that metaphor means, but I've heard it all my life. I'm not sure what a bad penny is, but apparently I am. Yeah. I, don't, I think you're a good penny. Yeah. <laughs> I keep I keep coming back because you know it's a, I mean there's always a part of you in CG that's going to seem sort of like home to me apparently, um, and you know I think when my first time I was an undergraduate I used to sleep I I wasn't on campus but I used to sleep on campus a lot on the on the couch in my office. Um, I was very involved in UNCG the first time I was here, not so much the second time I was here. Um, I guess presumably now that I work here, you could say I'm relatively involved again. Um, no, 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 it's a neat community. It's, you know, I think it's one of the more interesting and less antiseptic universities in North Carolina. You know, I'm not not to mention any universities by name, but you know, a lot of universities that sort of developed all at once in a cornfield, forty or fifty or. 20 or 30 or even 100 years ago sometimes I don't know they just seem kind of UNCG is a little quirkier than some universities yeah and I kind of like it here particularly in recent years you know we're quirky you know we used to be quirky and not terribly diverse mm -hmm. now we're actually quirky and diverse too because yeah. you know we are a minority serving institution we got people from all over the state, all over the country, and all over the world. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a much different student body than it was here. And I've I've really enjoyed watching that happen over the years. Um, yeah. And I like where we're at now. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you to look into the future and tell me what you think. Where do you see UNCG going in the next 20 or 30 years? Jets and cars and everything up on stilts. Okay. Um, <laughs> No more calf. Food araca cycles in every bedroom. All right. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, you uh, may be right. I mean, who knows? Yeah, I was counting on that for now, too, though, and we don't <laughs> yeah, have it we don't yet. Have it. Um, no, I think UCG can only get more diverse. Um, I think we've, we've recognized that our mission is to serve a lot of first generation college students. Uh, immigrant communities, et cetera, I think we're working with that mission very well. We understand it now and we've decided, yeah, this is the thing we do. And I'm glad we've decided that. I think we, we will see more of that in coming years. Um, UNCG is a landlocked urban campus. I sometimes wish UNCG would be better at recognizing that it's a landlocked urban campus rather than trying to spew forth into the, into the hinterland, bulldozing everything in its path. I fantasize about seeing a UNCG, and you know, I'm, I'm still an urbanist and a planner at heart, despite the fact that that's not the career path I went. I fantasize about a UNCG that's a lot more dense and a lot more vertical, mm -hmm. and is less into you know, edging out into the surrounding neighborhoods and maybe going more up mm -hmm. than out. Um, whether that will happen remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, I hope it'll happen. I think if we're going to grow past some level, it's going to have to happen because there's only going to be so many more neighborhoods we can buy out. And right. 
Of course, uh, we've already grown past where people said these are our boundaries. Yeah. Right? Lee Street used to be a boundary. And yeah, we used to, when so. I was here, uh, when, even back in the 80s when we were talking about, we used to refer to the boundary plans as Fortress UNCG. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like UNCG will own everything in this area. And yeah, it was going to be basically from Acock Street to Tate Street, from right. the railroad tracks to Market Street. And we've right. jumped those boundaries. I worry as we jump onto Tate Street, that gives me a little pause now. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm thinking, you know, it's, we're jumping into buildings that weren't being used for anything particularly useful before. Right. So maybe it will help Tate Street. Mm-hmm. Right. But. Yeah, I think the uh, <laughs> Lee Street Gate City Boulevard, that's uh, it's going to take a long time for people to get used to. Yeah. No, but I don't know that people really think of that as the university yet. Yeah. But 10, 20 years down the road? They maybe probably so. will. Yeah. I, yeah, I think uh, if we could build a bridge rather than a tunnel, that'd, that'd go a long way toward that connection. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Um, okay. Well, I don't have any more formal questions for you, but if there's anything else you'd like to add, this is the time to do so. I'm trying to think. Um, I have enjoyed talking to you. Memphis. It's been great. I, I hope. Uh, you know, I said I don't. I don't feel like I was in the middle of a lot of this stuff, but I think I was adjacent to to some interesting stuff over the past few years. So. Yeah, certainly. Um, and. Yeah, that's about all I got. Okay, well, thanks so much for talking with us. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.